What if investing success was not about how much money you invested or what you actually invested in or what you bought, whether it be real estate, buying a business, stocks, bonds, properties, commodity, whatever it is. Hi, I'm Jerry Krause. I'm the host of the Buying Online Businesses podcast. And today I'm speaking with Dr. Alan Lomax, who began a real estate career as a part-time accidental investor doing fix and flips and hold for rental income strategies in real estate. Now, him shifting from accidental to intentional investor, Alan now creates opportunities that empower successful entrepreneurs to substantially increase their financial well-being through passive hands-off real estate investments. And Alan believes it's never too late to attain financial freedom to live abundantly. And I totally agree with that. Now, in Alan's spare time, he passionately works with humans to help them understand their horses and develop excellent connections that create respectful and safe relationships between the horse and their humans. And in his podcast episode, Alan and I talk about so many great things about investing in businesses, real estate, or your time and your money in any direction. Now, we discuss the biggest obstacles that get in the way of people actually achieving passive income at any stage of their life. doesn't matter how old you are, what background you come from. We talk about those biggest obstacles that get in the way. And I have no doubt that then you may have a couple. We also talk about why people's fears are not actually false. And I talk about how they're actually real and they're in the body and people do feel these and what to do about it and how to move forwards in a more positive direction. We also talk about how similar real estate is to buying businesses. I talk a little bit about property and me investing in property as well. Alan also shares a few stories about horses and how they've helped him to become a better investor and a better mentor. And I also share some scuba diving stories on saving people from life changing mistakes. We also talk about the power of a quiet mind and some strategies that can allow you to have a more quiet mind that allows you to invest everything that you put out into the world, invest your energy, your time, your money, your effort in a far better way. Now there's so much value in this podcast episode. I'm sure you're going to love it, but this is not the only way that I do help people for free. We do talk about investing. And if you're going to buy a business, do not go away and do it yourself. I have my due diligence framework, which a lot of people use. It's helped people save millions of dollars and make millions of dollars. And you can get it for free by going to buyingonlinebusinesses.com forward slash free resources. That is, there'll be a link to that in the description. Now let's dive into the pod. Do you have a website you might want to sell either now or in the future? We have a hungry list of cashed up and trained up buyers that want to buy your content website. If you have a site making over $300 per month and want to sell it, head to buyingonlinebusinesses.co forward slash sell your business or email us at info at buyingonlinebusinesses.com because we will likely have a buyer. The details are in the description. Alan, thank you so much for coming on the Buying Online Businesses podcast. Welcome. Well, thank you. I'm excited to be here and looking for a delightful chat. Yeah, me too. I think we're going to have a great chat today around mindset. Um, You're big in helping people earn passive income. Your vehicle of choice and how you help people is through real estate. I'm very big into real estate. Um, I'm actually buying another property at the moment, commercial property in Australia. Uh, I love the property market. I also have a property podcast too that most people probably haven't really released that to public. It's the first time that I'm releasing that to public. I've been running that for about a year now um, with my best friend who has a lot of experience in property um, and has helped a lot of buyers agents in Australia scale their businesses. Like he used to be a valuer. So big into property and I'm big into passive income. I first started my journey to replace my income because I used to be a plumber uh, and I wanted to earn passive income so I could travel around the world. What That was my goal. What What's most people's goal when they come to you and they say, hey, Alan, I want to, you know, I want to get the passive, get some passive income. Where, you know, what's their main driver? And then how do you, for me, I have to help people reinforce their and remember their vision and their driver to stay committed to the path because there's some i want to i want to talk about some things that people do when they trip up on their journey to replacing their income but let's start with like what how do people come come and find you and and what's their major goal with passive income well yeah i mean um experienced uh, investors come to us and they have you know different motivations than those who are uh, just starting out but those who are, are new to passive income, I think they probably have uh, a lot of the motivation that I did when I was uh, first starting out. I had a W-2 job. I was uh, a professor at the university. 
loved it, was passionate about it. I didn't have any desire to get out of that because it brought tremendous fulfillment. But whether you're, you know, whether you're uh, an entrepreneur out there on your own, uh, doing your own thing, or whether you're working as a W-2, either way, you're exchanging your time and your efforts and your creativity uh, for money. And as long as that's working, well, that's, that's good and fine, and particularly if you find it rewarding like I did. But there's always this low-level chronic anxiety. Uh, if you're a W-2 employee like I was with the university, my employer can pull that rug out from under me at any point in time they want to. If you're an entrepreneur doing your own thing out there, uh, you don't have an employer pulling the rug out from under you, but you don't know when you could wake up with a chronic illness. You don't know when you could have a serious accident. And when you're exchanging your time, effort, and your money, that can be taken out from under you at any point in time. And so I think that that, that chronic low-level anxiety that any of us in that situation are constantly experiencing is stressful, and, and we want to alleviate that stress. That certainly was my motivation and my desire to develop a passive stream of income that would be there if I lost my job, if I had a chronic illness where I couldn't perform, I wanted something there that I could fall back on. So uh, that typically, I think, is the motivation that most most people come to us with. Yeah, it's a good backup plan. And that's the same with my other investments uh, as a backup plan, you know, whether I have, um, you know, investments in stocks, bonds, cryptos, um, or, you know, property is like, in case one of my businesses just decides to blow up, then I have a backup plan. And I think it's a very, very important thing to have for, to allow people to go through life with less stress knowing that hey if i lose my job it's okay if i lose something like this it's okay you've got multiple you know backup plans now passive income for me it was pretty difficult to get there i started a couple of businesses failed realized that i didn't know anything about digital marketing <laughs> uh mm -hmm. and you come a long ways. Yeah, it's it's a very it's a very big path to go from no edge or I mean I did high school education but no university or, or college or anything like that to to you know uh, entrepreneur and you know wealth creator and stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, it, that's a big path for most most of us if we haven't grown up in an entrepreneurial family. It's a big step for all of us. Yeah. I definitely, I think people underestimate how long or how much effort might actually go into it. Where, and I, I've, I've, I would say that I've achieved some pretty cool things after replacing my income and being in business. But I still revert back to saying the hardest thing that I ever did was getting out of that that rat race. Now, what are some of the things that you have foreseen with the people that you help coach and teach and guide that has tripped them up on their journey to you know, getting these other assets and getting into the passive income game. Well, so so many of the people that come to us are like me. I, I started off in the single family uh, gamut with uh, uh, fixing properties for uh, for rental income, and uh, and I think that that trips up a lot of people because they think, well. Uh, this is working, and it was working. It was helping to develop my income. But after five, six years of that, I was still working to develop a passive income. Uh, and one property at a time, one property at a time, that's a long, long way to get there. But uh, I don't know about in Australia and Bali, but uh, in the U.S. we have this um, this. Uh, show it's um, GHTV, and they have these house flippers on there, and they glamorize this process. And a lot of people buy into that—that that this is the way to develop a passive stream of income. 
and and it's sort of working for them. So it's kind of challenging to get people to go beyond that single family uh, process to go that, yeah, you can invest passively in commercial properties and you can do it with less hassle, less headache, uh, less heartache, and you can get to that passive income a whole lot faster than you can. So it's busting that particular myth that, that you can do this one house at a time. Uh, that's probably the biggest myth to bust there. I like that myth. And that's a very similar myth to the online business asset investing space as well. I never, I've learned to do the, um, in real estate, I've done a bunch of courses as well. Um, I did five years of education before I, in real estate before I bought my first property. Um, and I was going to go down the buy, f- renovate and flip and realize that, hey, that's a fair bit of work and it's not passive at all. In fact, it's very hands-on um, and it can be costly. And the more times that you do this, the entry costs and then the exit costs, they all compound. And yeah, and it's a scary thing. And it's the same with online businesses doing this when you buy something and then you renovate it and flip it and try to chunk up to a larger asset you it's not passive it's very very active and in like you said with like renovating residential properties i can relate that to like renovating small online businesses whereas if people start to go to the more commercial route in commercial property it's far more passive and less work you are hiring people to manage the property which is what we do with larger businesses as well. We typically hire or have a team that we acquire with the business that manages the business. And then we can bring in people to do growth, you know, situations and stuff like that um, in the, in the business. So I, I see the correlations and I know the correlations between like I'm buying a commercial property right now, right? Uh, a warehouse with a retail outfit to, attached to it. And, it's so similar to business and this is why I love property and I love business as they work in together is that we need to understand that you can, some people need to get started at a small level, but it is a lot more work. But if you can get to that point, and I think as a bit of a goal or a, or a large stepping stone for people to get to that point where they can buy larger assets and have better professionals run them and grow them for them versus let's, uh, let's stay in this game of, of flipping and renovating for so long. What, what do you think about that? Well, that, that's the myth number two, actually, is that, that it takes more to get into commercial investing. And, and of course, if you're going to do it on your own, then certainly, yeah, you're correct about that. But the way that we do it, we do it through, uh, through syndication. And that's a big, scary word. Uh, people associate syndication with the mafia, but a syndication, all a syndication is, is just a group of people coming together to, uh, for the same goal and to attain the same ends. And so the real estate syndications, we come together as a group with the goal of, uh, of purchasing properties to give to our investors, uh, a higher than average uh, rate of return. And uh, so the way we bust that myth is that there are actually two levels to this. There are the active investors in a syndication, and then there are the passive investors in the syndication. And so the active investors, uh, they do all of that groundwork. They find the properties, they put the uh, purchase agreements in place, they negotiate the prices, they do the underwriting to be sure that the numbers uh, work and that it's a viable investment. They do all of the due diligence, uh, inspections, electrical, plumbing, HVAC, roofing, flooring, so on and so forth. Go through it in complete and total detail. They complete the purchase, put the management teams in place, and then oversee the management process throughout the process of that. That's the active side of it. The passive side of it 
are the individuals who bring their money to that. And since we're pooling uh, that, those resources, any individual is not putting a tremendous amount of their investment into any one particular investment. So it's much more in reach of people than what most people uh, think about that. We also have a similar thing. Uh, we have in my group of people that I help um, in the Bob community, uh, we have a bunch of investors that are you know, partnering with one another and going in and looking to buy businesses together uh, versus singular, singularly as well. Um, and they learn from each other and they, it, it's nice to take, go on this journey with other people as well. Uh, I find because sometimes you have those days where you're like, Oh, I'm like, you know, not super keen on doing the work or, or whatnot. And then you've got other days that, you know, other people will lift you up. Uh, I think that's pretty important. I want to, I want to ask you, you've, you've had quite a amazing life and what you've learned through your life is, is quite amazing. Alan, you have a relationship with horses. So tell me about, you know, what horses have, or how you got into, you know, training horses and what horses have taught you and how, how do you help people understand their connection to their horses or is this vehicles? Like, like you mentioned on your, on your site. I'd love to just open up that. In, if there's a story that you need to share around it, um, I'd love to hear. Well, I appreciate you asking that because certainly it's a topic I love to talk about. I've been interested in horses all my life. I actually had a horse when I was a teenager. Um, went off to college and into adulthood, and there just really weren't a whole lot of opportunities for that, or at least I, I didn't uh, didn't make those opportunities. And it really wasn't until I was in my 50s that I looked at this situation. I'm going, I really would love to have horses in my life. I've always wanted them. And I'm 53 years old, and I'm going, I'm not getting any younger. I've got uh, to do this. And so I hired a riding teacher, started really learning to ride, and uh, a, a close friend of mine uh, was uh, an equestrian all her life, so she was helping me to scout out and, and find a horse. So I, I found a horse, uh, brought uh, this horse into my life, and fell in love with the horse, and uh, continued the riding lessons, started working with natural, what they call natural horsemanship, and through that process, I was just having a wonderful, wonderful, glorious time. But I, at the same time that I was enjoying it, I'm, I was coming to the realization that even with these so-called natural horsemanship techniques that we're putting in place here, the horse is not getting out of this experience what I'm getting out of it. And so I began to feel like an oppressor rather than uh, having a shared experience with that. And so I started looking around uh, for other people who were experiencing perhaps the same things that I was experiencing. And I came across uh, Stormy May and her documentary. She did this, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago. It's out there on YouTube. It's free. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful documentary. And it's called the path of the horse. And, and as I was watching this, uh, I just began to weep. Uh, and I realized that the reason I didn't have the relationship with the horse that I wanted, that the horses that I was working with, even through this natural horsemanship, we were abusing those horses. Uh, bits are painful to horses. Uh, in the equestrian world, they're in total and complete denial of that, but bits are painful. Uh, the, the, uh, and if you, if you watch anything with horses, in e even uh, just casual people riding on horses, you'll notice that 
almost invariably, they're yanking on those bits. And if you'll watch that horse, you'll see that horse go like that, and you can see that pain resonate through their whole entire body because their mouth is a very, very sensitive part of, of, their, org- of their anatomy. So watching that, then I, I found another practitioner. James, his name is James French. He's in the UK, and he has uh, a school that is called the Trust Technique. And through that uh, experience is what I really, really started to learn how to really connect with horses and not just horses it it works with with other horses so if i can tell you a story here (laughs) because this is a recent story um i have a friend who just acquired a horse uh this was uh three or four months ago she wanted a quarter horse because she wanted essentially she wanted a rocking chair horse that was gentle and calm, and all she had to do was just get on and ride uh, this horse. Well, it turns out this horse that she acquired, sure enough, he does have some quarter horse blood in there, but he also has some thoroughbred blood in there. And if the novices who don't know anything about these breeds, the thoroughbred is the racehorse. That's the horse you see on the tracks that's in Australia, in US, all around the world. That's the racehorse. And the quarter horse is, uh, is the horse that you usually see um, in, uh, in reining activities and um, in, uh, in barrel racing and things like that as well. But they just have a much stabler, uh, personality and uh, and they are just much more much less spirit to them where the thoroughbred they want to run that is what they were bred to do and they want to do that and they're highly spirited so she was having trouble with this horse because uh, it wasn't the horse she wanted and she just wasn't able to deal with this so she wanted me to come and uh, to help her with this. And uh, of course, when I went out to see the horse, I mean, he was all uh, high and spirited and uh, holding his head high and wanted, uh, and all he wanted to do was move. And so what I did was I just went out there and stood with him and stood behind him and really what is a mindfulness meditation process. And within 20 minutes of that, that horse had brought his head down. And for the first time, we were able to put a bridle on him, and it's a bitless bridle that I use. And we put that bridle on him, and for the first time, she was able to get on and to ride that horse and all it took, there was no training involved in that, no coercion, it was just mindfulness meditation. And horses, humans, dogs, cats, it works the same way. We all have feelings and we all want peace and quiet in our lives. And that's all that horse really ever wanted. Wow. That's a beautiful story, Alan. Thank you so much for sharing. There's, I'd love to know, I'd love to pick your brains on how you, what you have learned through being with horses and riding horses and learning about horses, uh, and, and how that relates to investing, um, and life and or life. Um, I'm, I, you know, I love, I love buying businesses, I love buying property, but like my I, I run that through my own philosophies first and I only do it in the way that I think is the best possible way for everybody a part of the, the deal and the journey. Um, and I obviously uh, meditate every day, sometimes twice a day. Um, I'm a, it's a massive, if, if some people have asked me like, what's the one thing that you need to get rid of out of your life and the one thing that you'd need to keep in your life that you do daily, um, the one thing I'd keep would definitely be 
meditation. Um, it's the most valuable task that I do at, like, and that's compared to business, property, investing, everything like that. So quiet mindfulness for growth. You do talk about that. Tell me, tell me like some of the lessons or can you share some of the lessons with us around how quiet mindfulness has not just helped you, but helped everybody that you've worked with through their journey in investing? Well, it, it uh, well, just, just another story. And this, this actually takes me back to my years when I was an administrator in higher education, uh, really before really stepping um, into these things that I have learned really later on in my life. But I was, um, I was an administrator and I had uh, directors working under me and uh, there, uh, the advising center was under me and the tutoring centers were under me. We had gone through this process with the advising uh, center to do uh, online uh, scheduling so that students could schedule their appointments from their dorm room or wherever, wherever it was that they were. And so we had, had, uh, we had this app and we had put it in place and, and developed that app for the advising center. So I wanted the uh, tutors, uh, the tutoring uh, uh, directors, to do the same thing, and so I was putting on. I was. I put a lot of pressure on them. I said, "We have this app. Why don't you just use this app? Take this app and apply it to the tutoring center." And they actually were trying to do that, and they were extraordinarily frustrated in doing that. So we had a meeting one day. And they really hadn't made the progress that I wanted them to. And so I was really hard on them. I said, you need to get this together and get this done. There's no reason not to have the scheduling in place. So we left that meeting. And afterwards, a director came up to me in tears and said, we've really been working on this. This app is not, is not working for the tutoring center. But we have been doing some research. And there actually is an app out there designed for tutors. Well, that was a wake up moment for me, really, even at that time. And, and it applies to today because had I been applying mindfulness at that particular point in time, I would never have put that kind of pressure on those directors because they were diligent. They were doing their jobs. They wanted, they wanted the same thing I wanted, but I put them in a very uncomfortable position because I couldn't quiet my mind and come to a point in place where they were. So in terms of investing, uh, investors who come to us and, and are looking for a place to put their money and to invest, uh, how do I apply that? I just, I just apply it quietly. We always have a consultation to start out, and I never, I never put any pressure on them. I just explain to them what it is that we do and how the process works. And I do so in a very quiet, mindful manner. And I don't necessarily always say this, but I always have in that quiet place, in that quiet mind, that this is a process for your well-being. And if this isn't working for you, it's not your well-being then we don't want you investing with us because it's not the right thing to do. So it, it's just every consultation I come to, I come to that with a quiet mind. And every consultation, I have a few moments of meditation before that consultation. Um, I have a, a mindfulness practice just like you do, but I also have time throughout the day where I have that mindfulness. Wow. I love that. I absolutely love that. And I just want to applaud you on, and this is a huge, huge thing I think that people listening may not have picked up on that I did. And I hope people start to maybe pick up on this in their own lives is I want to applaud you on your self-awareness, uh, you catching yourself and going, I didn't do the best service to these, to this staff to this group at that time with this app and 
you coming back and reflecting on that and going, wow, I could have handled this a bit differently and putting your ego aside completely or just completely disregarding that ego and going, wow, I could have done this in a different way that would have helped everybody a lot faster. And I think the, the most successful people are people that do learn to have that self-awareness in their life and then re- and then have that self-awareness in how they behave and how they show up in their investments as well. Uh, and that self-awareness from what I have learned in my life and what I see through your stories is it comes about from a quiet mind. It comes about from that meditation and how valuable that meditation is. A quiet mind <clears throat> absolutely helps people be not rushed and be more patient and make the investments at the right time because timing is so important i feel in investing in anything and i believe it has to feel right and sometimes i've well not sometimes a lot of times i've noticed people that are in a rush make and i have done this to myself as well when i'm in a rush i make poorer decisions because i'm more stressed right and the more things that are going on in my mind, the more problems I'm trying to solve and I've got too much going on, I will, my stress levels will be a bit higher and I will be more tired, I'll be less aware and I will make mistakes, right? Like I might, you know, trip over something or I'll lose my keys or, you know, whatever it is uh, if I don't have a quiet mind. And if you think of that, about that in your daily life, it's, it's, it's big, but if you relate that to like what you said with investing, it's absolutely massive. And I feel that for you, Alan, that I, I don't know, I, I, I'd have to ask everybody that I work with, um, but when people come to you and speak about, you know, hey, I want to make an investment or I want to put my money somewhere and, and you are just with them and you're very present, uh, that presence provides confidence and when they look at you, that that energy exchange, they can see that, like, hey, like this is if this is right for you, let's do it. If it's not right for you, let's let's not do it. That is a huge thing that people are really needing when they're coming to make an investment in money or do something that's dangerous. I've got a story where I used to be a dive master and I used to live in Egypt. And I used to take people scuba diving a couple of times a day. And you can't just rush to the surface if you freak out. When, when you're scuba diving because you can get the bends and you can get nitrogen narcosis and stuff like that. Anyway, somebody- I did. <laughs> you've done that before? No, I didn't. I didn't get the bends. I, I rushed to the surface. I mean, we weren't, we, weren't that, we weren't that far down, but my son, my son was running out of oxygen and, uh, and I could see that. And, and I just completely lost it and, and we went to the surface. Which was a bad thing to do. Yeah, we weren't. I, but fortunately, we weren't that far down. But yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it, I know what you're talking about. Very fortunately, we weren't too far down. <laughs> I was about twenty five, yeah. twenty to twenty five meters deep with somebody, and they had sort of freaked out a bit. And um, I, they would like, I grabbed them. They started like started to swim to the surface. So I, I had literally grabbed them and pulled them down, and they were fighting me underwater like it was an actual rough battle because they're in fear right and so like they're kicking and like hitting me and i'm underwater and i've done a lot of diving and i think i'm a i would say i'm a quite a confident swimmer i've spent most of my life in the water and so what i did is i had to just shock them and take them out of their present state and get them into a calm state before you know before they were just bailed and up to the top so i grabbed the person And I just literally went into survival mode for them and just shook them as hard as I could with the, with the BCD, which is that jacket that they would be wearing. I shook them as hard as they could to not like hit the person on the face or anything bad like that, but shook them out of their fear. And then had that person, I knew a lot about the eyes and trust and um, bringing people into a calmer state. And I just shook them out of their fear and then had them, like very strongly look at me with the look at me signals and all the stuff underwater that you, that you teach when you're a dive master, um, look at me and they, they stopped, they looked into my eyes and I was just like showing them like, all right, let's just slow down. Let's just like breathe through this. 
relax and it's going to be okay. And I, I just, they just slowed down, stopped, relaxed, didn't, didn't rush the surface. And then we were able to continue the dive. And it was so important after that, that person was like, wow, okay. Like if I had to go onto the top, you know, it would have been the worst thing possible for me. And then, yeah, it was, and that comes from what you said is like, when you're talking to somebody is you can only do it with, you can only in that state when, when shit hits the fan, excuse my language. If you practice mindfulness, you could be present and not make bad decisions. You can make far better decisions. And that's so important when you've got financing, money, all this cash that you've saved up, you're about to invest something and then you've got all these things going on in your head and you're freaking out and you're stressing. You really need somebody like you, Alan, to like, oh, it's okay. I've done this multiple times and this is the normal process. So let's just speak through it. Let's just go through it and let's just go through the process normally. This is totally normal. Be with me. And that's a big thing that I think people are missing when they're coming to invest do you, do you see that those similar patterns where people have that freak out phase or they get worried or impatient and start to make decisions that aren't the best for them as they're going through their journey? Absolutely. And particularly people who are new with us and, uh, and, and they know us through our website. They know me through my podcast, but that is a distant kind of knowing. And so they don't have the trust levels that investors who have been with us have. And yes, they're going, and yes, I see them doing this all the time. And, and I mean, I'm, I'm always advising them to go to their financial advisors and their uh, attorneys to have all of this information checked out. The problem is, is that there's not really a whole lot of financial advisors out there who actually know really anything about real estate investing. And so I see them actually going to financial advisors who really aren't qualified to advise them. And they do that because they're looking for that assurance. They've, I'm going to put this money up. Oh, but let me check with my financial advisor. It's that panic moment. And and it doesn't work out well for them because they know their previous financial advisor. And even though they don't know what they're talking about, they take their advice rather than, than going forward with an investment that would be hugely, hugely beneficial to them. It's a shame, isn't it? Because it's, I would relate it similar to like a doctor. Like if you go to a specialist about, you say, your knee, Right, so you need, you know, you've hurt your knee, your ACL or your MCL, and you, uh, you go to a specialist, knee specialist, and they say, all right, we need to do this um, to improve your knee, and then you go to a generalist like a financial advisor, and you say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this strategy, this investment strategy within, like, towards my knee health. And the GP can typically say, oh no that's not the right way to go and they'll prescribe a different strategy based on what they feel is within their comp competent wheel of competence, right? Versus a specialist who knows so much more about the knee. Uh, and it's a shame because I feel a lot of people put a lot of weight on general advisors that they have spent time with or have sort of maybe helped them a little bit in, in the past. However, you know, if you, if you continue doing the same things you've always done, you're going to get the same results you've always got. And if you want to go a different, to go to a different place, you need to change your strategy. Right. And you need to listen pe to people like you, Alan, where like, Hey, we've do, we do this investment strategy so many times. And these are the results we've got for people. Uh, it's a, it's a tricky, it's a mindset. It's really a mindset issue, isn't it? Where people need to open up to changing, uh, how they, their mental model and their view of the world and their, and how they should move forwards with investments or, or not. What are some of the, do you have some particular philosophies or mindsets that you normally teach to people to help get them through certain stages like this without, obviously you're not, you're not a person that is, uh, you know, you're a person that is a more of supportive role and, and a guider and a helper versus, 
you know, the opposite. What are some of the strategies that you share with people or offer and open to people that they can use to get through some of these times, these, these times where they're like, I want to do this, but I've got all this, this, this stuff going on in my head. <laughs> well, you know, first of all is, you know, listen, listen to them and, uh, and talk with them about what is their fear, what is their anxiety, and let them go through that uh, fear process. And, um, and, you know, ask them, you know, looking at the investment offering that we're looking at here, are these fears really actually legitimate fears? Or are they just built upon anxieties that really aren't there. And, uh, and so let's look at, at this investment opportunity from that fear perspective. And, uh, and what is it about this, this investment that you're afraid of? Are you afraid that you aren't going to get uh, your capital back? Are you afraid that you're going to put your capital in here and it's not going to uh, provide a return on your investment. Those are all legitimate fears. So, and so let's first of all let's let's take a look here at the numbers. We've got the numbers. Uh, our 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 team has gone through these numbers upside down and backwards and analyzed it a hundred and one different ways. So let's take a look at it. And if after you're taking a look at these numbers, do you feel, do you still feel like this is something to be afraid of? Uh, and if you don't want to put your money here, what are your alternatives? Um, well, you can go to your CDs. You can just park your money in CDs and earn interest less than inflation is that a good thing for you? Uh, you can uh, put it in index funds in the stock market that probably is kind of equal to inflation, but probably not really getting you ahead of that. Is that a good thing for you? Um, you can put it in uh, to selective stocks, and uh, if you know what you're doing, that could be a very profitable and good thing. How much time and effort and research are you willing to put into that to ensure that that's a good investment? So, you know, what are your other options? Uh, you could, uh, like many of uh, our new clients have done, you could put that into another single family home. Um, and then you've got all those headaches that come with managing your single family home. Uh, and you've set yourself back uh, another time. So you can think about those things from that number perspective. But another thing I just like to do is just, let's just get quiet here and just be calm about this. And I want to talk about some of the intangible benefits of passive real estate investing. Um, would you like to be part of a, a team that is operating an effective and efficient complex where the tenants are happy and content and glad to be living there? Do you want to be part of a team that takes a crack house community and turns it into a community where children can play without supervision in the playgrounds? Do you want to be part of the solution of solving this housing shortage uh, that we're facing here in America, where we can provide comfortable, aesthetic, and appealing, affordable housing uh, for a community in need of those things? Those are the other things. They're, they're certainly not your tangible rewards, but those are the rewards that are part of being part of a, 
a team that knows what they're doing. And the other thing to think about in terms of helping to alleviate these fears are the team that you're going to be investing with is an experienced team. They've been through this process. Uh, at least they've, tend, they've turned at least 10 properties from start to finish and have consistently returned high returns that, that double your money within three to five years. So tell me about your fears. Yeah, I like that. It's, it's really good to not... I know that in sales, and I've learned a lot about sales and I have had, I've, I've had a sales team and I've taught sales teams myself, um, a, there is a lot of uh, what they call objection handling um you know somebody will put up a fear and then they just try and prove why that fear isn't like you know and it's more of a forceful way why that fear should not be justified versus saying hey that's a leg- like there's this thing that's going on in your head that is f- literally and physically likely physically but definitely mentally making you feel or allowing you to feel a certain way which is stressed and worried and anxious and that's not a lie your body's not lying your body does not lie to you you're feeling those feels because of what's going on between your head so let's understand that that's let's unpack that this is what a good therapist does and i believe the best coaches and the best mentors basically are not uh just you know they don't just have a certain amount of ip and teach a certain amount of ip the best coaches and mentors are just therapists in fact my coaching clients call me a business therapist because they come to me with all these things freaking out and they leave with one or two strategies that they're more empowered to go away and take action on. Um, and that's what, that's what that is with a mentor that has that level of quiet mind, uh, and presence and awareness can say, Hey, let's legitimately feel these feels and, and see if like you should be feeling these feels or not, um, feeling these fears. And what are your options? You could go and not invest it in this strategy or like, like you said, you just presented all those different options, investment strategies, like Alan, and then you presented one that was like, well, you could do it my way or not. And I'm not making you do either, but you go away, have a think about it, see which one feels a bit more comfortable for you, see which one feels less, ang- you have less anxiety around and then let's move towards, you know, you, you should go away and do, do the one that is better for you, makes you feel better about your life. So I'm, I, I love that, Alan. I love, the way, I love the way that you listen. I love the way that you're present. And I love the way that you, you know, you're guiding people to make decisions better for them based on what is right for them, not just the opposite way where there's a lot of people that are in the world that are, you know, forcing so yeah, I, I just want to say thanks, Alan, so much for coming on and having a chat and and sharing sharing your stories, sharing what you've been through, um, and sharing some of your strategies. It's it's really been a privilege to to chat. I really really do appreciate it. Thank you. It's been a privilege for me as well, um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you. And uh, well, I've been impressed with you as a host and uh, impressed with you as a person as well. So. Thank you so much, Jared. Thank you, Alan. Where can we send people? What what link can we send people to to check out more about what you're up to? The we've been talking about horses. Uh, the best place to go is to steedtalker.com forward slash webinar, and Steed is like the horse, uh, and Talker is like I'm doing now. So that is steedtalker.com forward slash webinar. And in that webinar, it is uh, entitled Real Estate Investing Reimagined. And you'll learn more about uh, the five elements that make real estate investing the ideal investment, discover how to substantially reduce your tax liabilities, learn the secrets of recession proofing your nest egg, beat the eroding power of inflation, and explore the unique ways to find the syndicators who possess the 
ethics and morals that you possess and to have the deep and wide experience that you need to know uh, that they have in order to have peace of mind uh, investing with us. So that is steedtalker.com forward slash webinar. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alan. Everybody that is listening, thank you for listening. If you, I don't typically ask you guys to do much when you're listening to these podcast episodes. However, this podcast episode was gold. We talked so much about investing without talking about actually investing. We talked about mindset. We talked about philosophies. We talked about strategies that are going to help you invest not just your money in investments, but your time. It's going to make your life so much better. So what I would love for you to do is if you did get value from this episode, please share this with one person that you know that is trying to grow in, at some way or some stage or some direction in their life that you feel this could add value to them. Thanks so much, guys, and I'll speak to you on the next one. Hey, YouTube watcher, if you thought that video is good, you should check out this video here on the two best types of websites beginners should buy or check out my playlist on how I made my first 100K from buying websites and how to do due diligence. Check it out, it's an awesome playlist, you'll enjoy it.